Welcome everyone to Young at Heart, session number 120. I'm Father James DeLucio with the Paulist Fathers back here in our parlor to share fairy tales, nursery rhymes, mother goose, stories, songs, poems, Aesop's fables, nonsense to keep us all young at heart. I haven't shared a story with you in quite some time, so I thought I'd return to what has become my most favorite fairy tale of all. It's not from Brothers Grimm. It's not from Hans Christian Andersen. It's not from English folktales, but comes from the French, written down first as a lengthy, lengthy novel of over 350 pages by a French authoress. Yet, it was finally condensed by another very wise French woman and then ultimately translated into English in the early 18th century. That is the text that I'm going to share with you. And not to worry, it's not very archaic. It doesn't sound like Shakespeare. It's quite accessible. How did I first come to this story, not knowing it from childhood, but from the Walt Disney animated feature, Beauty and the Beast, which remains my favorite animated classic um, of all time, as they overuse that phrase <laughs> in all the Disney uh, advertising. There's also a beautiful film, live action from France from the 1950s by Jean Cocteau. It's called Bête et Belle, Beast and Beauty, that is my goodness, what about it? It's very engaging, quite different from the Disney. It's not a musical, and it brings a lot of depth and psychological insight into the story. So I highly recommend that to you. And as for the story, why don't we begin? Oh, yes, it's kind of lengthy even in this quite, quite shortened version, uh, but I'm going to read one page. See, that's the length of of the piece per page. Okay. So <laughs> that's what you have in store for you today. Take out other versions. You may have some in your on your bookshelves. Uh, and let's compare and contrast when the story is through in several sessions from hence. Beauty and the Beast. Now there once was a very rich merchant, and he had six children, three sons and three daughters. Being a man of sense, he spared no cost for their education and provided his children with many masters. His daughters were extremely handsome, especially the youngest. When she was very little, so many people admired her that they called her the little beauty. And as she grew, she still went by the name of beauty, which made her sisters very jealous. The youngest, she was the most handsome. She was also better than her sisters the two eldest had a great deal of pride because they were rich. They gave themselves ridiculous airs, and they would not visit with other merchants' daughters, nor keep company with anyone but whom they deemed persons of quality. They went out every day upon parties of pleasure with balls and plays and concerts, etc. And they laughed at their youngest sister because she spent the greatest part of her free time reading books. As it was known that they were people of great fortune, several eminent merchants made addresses to the women but the two eldest said they would never marry unless they could meet with a duke or an earl at the very least. Beauty very civilly thanked those who courted her, but she told them she was too young yet to marry 
but chose to stay with her father a few years longer. Now all at once, the merchant lost his fortune, except for a small country house that stood a great distance from the town and he told his children with tears in his eyes that they must go there and they would all have to work hard for their living. The two eldest daughters answered that they would not leave the town for they had several lovers and they were sure that one of these would be glad to have them even though they had lost their fortune. But the good ladies were gravely mistaken, for their lovers slighted and forsook them in their poverty, as they were not beloved on account of their pride, everybody said. They do not deserve to be so pitied. We're very glad to see their pride humbled. Let them go and give themselves quality airs in milking the cows and minding their own dairy. But they added, they were all extremely concerned for beauty, for she was such a charming, sweet-tempered creature. She spoke so kindly to the poor, and she was so affable. She had an obliging behavior. Nay, several gentlemen would have married her at once, even though they knew she had not a penny. But she told them that she could not think of leaving her poor father in his misfortune, but she was determined to go along with her father to the country to comfort and attend to him. Poor Beauty at first was sadly grieved at the loss of good fortune, but she said to herself, were I to cry ever so much, that would not make things any better. I must try to make myself happy without a fortune. When they came to the country house, the merchant and his three sons applied themselves to husbandry and tillage, and beauty rose at four in the morning, and she made haste to have the house clean and the meals ready for the family. Mm. And so ends our first page. You can see, of course, where this, this is going. And I bet you are surprised to find there are so many children in this family and what is going to become of all of them and how are we going to encounter the beast in this of the oldest versions of beauty and the beast. Now there's another popular English version by an, what's his name, Andrew Lang? I think Adam Lang. And you can look that up. I think it's on um, I think it's on the internet. So you can get it for free. Also worded differently than this, but pretty close. Thanks so much for joining me. I hope I've intrigued you in my favorite fairy tale. Beauty and the Beast, we'll see you tomorrow. Meanwhile, stay healthy, wear your masks, keep safe, and God bless. Bye, everyone.